in the class six folder, there are stems for mixing. There's one, two, well, we're not going to use this one. So there's four songs here that you can choose from. And our next project, we're going to have two, maybe three more projects for the rest of the semester. The next project is going to be learning how to import stems and do a mix. And we're going to really work on mixing. In this folder are my mixes of these that you can use as a reference. Inside of here is a standard MIDI file and 10 audio files. They're all named. And you can see by the size, they're all the same size. That's because they're all, except for the MIDI file. So if I do the kind, right, all of these are 26.7 megabytes. That's because they're all the same length. So what I'm going to do is open up a new and I'm going to call this light orc mix. Whoops. All right. I need to do one more thing. Great. Okay. So I'm going to do a new session and I'm going to do this on my desktop. Now, if you notice here, right, the tempo is written in the name of, so this one is at 59 beats per minute. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, I've got, before I do anything, I've got measure one. I'm going to go right here and I'm going to enter my tempo. So we're all good. And then to import audio, all right, you can go to this, this here, right, and then go to here. But it's easy just to remember Command Shift I for import. And then go to your desktop, stems, select the top one. Hold the shift key down, go to the bottom one. And what we want to do, avoid this blue, the blue pill. <laughs> avoid the blue one. You don't want to add, you want to copy. So this way they will be inside of the audio folder in your session folder. And let me show you what I mean by that in real time. So right now, there's no audio files in there. So let me make this smaller. Let me cancel this for a second. Let me make this smaller, and then I can have that folder. And Pro Tools on the same screen. So you see this is empty now. I, I've gone over this before. You all know it, but I think this is a good way to show you what I mean. So... If I click Add, nothing will get put into the Audio Files folder. And that's what we want everything to go into because we want to have one container that has our entire project. So we're going to copy. And we're going to hit Done. And then you see how they're all going in that folder? They populated that folder. New track, Session Start. Now, does anybody know the key command so that I can see the entire timeline in the edit window? Is it the op option control A command? Very good. Option control A. Right. Well, so, Professor, when I handed in my first draft of the mix, you said that the... Uh, the samples weren't in the folder. How do we, how do you like fix that? Do you just you need to drag all those samples into your session folder? Uh, the set the folder that has all your samples just needs to be inside the session folder, and then I, it'll I can find them. Okay, cool. So when you know with contact, they have to be in that folder, and they. But when you make when you make your own like 
a, a patch, it doesn't automatically put it into the folder, I guess, right? Into the session folder? No, it goes into the, where, where you've, dis where, right. It, it just references those audio files from the folder that they're living in. So if it's in a okay, separate then, place, if you want to send the Pro Tools uh, session. Then it needs to you need to copy them. Correct, yourself. correct. And and the reason for that is because you're sending me your project, right? And I need to be able to access those files. I have my all my samples on on a hard drive on my desktop. It's easy for me to find. I mean, in in one of my in one of my hard drives, I've got a folder with my own personal sample libraries that are programmed for contact. Now, the thing that's a drag about Structure Free, and they really, you know, it's been, they haven't updated the software in over a decade, Structure Free, right? Is that you send me your project, even if those, you've, you've done everything as I've asked, when I open up a session, the, the files aren't loaded in. I have to open up each individual track and I have to do a, a spotlight search, and then they load them in, right? And that's not anything that you guys have done. That's because they've so crippled the functionality of Structure Free, and they've made it really limited. Um, if we were doing this in contact, I could just open it up, and it would all load in, no problem. So, yeah. All right, so... Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I don't need to have the instrument track because these are audio files. So I'm going to make some space. And I need to have my sends. And these are all now highlighted. So I'm going to unhighlight them by, let's see, let's do this so you can see the keyboard. I'm going to hold Option and then click on one of the names, and they're all unhighlighted. Now, this is an orchestra piece. So I want to set this up so it looks like a score. And that would be winds, brass, percussion, and strings. That's how an orchestra score is set up. We don't have brass, I don't think. So we don't have to worry about that. And we have a harp, a glock, which is a bell instrument, and a, a piano. So harp, piano, and glock. So that would be our percussion, right? So th that's pitched percussion. So what we're going to do is we're going to order our tracks. So we're going to take our flute, and I'm going to drag it up to the top. The bassoon, clarinet above the bassoon, right? Because clarinet's a higher pitch. We've got oboe below the flute. And I think that my wins are done. Now I've got piano, harp, where's our bells? Here we go. And then we've got violins, cellos, and low strings. Okay, and let's get these. Now, what would you think the next thing I, I want to do as far as organization goes? Color coding. Uh, right? Colors. Yeah. 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 So I want it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have my wins all be one color. And I'm just going to go from left to right. You could do whatever you'd like. Oh, I missed one. Let me add it. Now notice I missed the bassoon, right? The bassoon is still green. I turned all of these, this purplish color. If I hold down the shift key and click on this and open up the palette again, you notice that there are two colors selected. So you know if I just click here, they'll all change. But you can see which hue of purple you've ch changed them to. And then we've got these three. And I'll make these a reddish color. And my strings... Okay, my dog is barking. I hope there's nothing going on outside. Somebody's burgling my house. No, I'm only kidding. 
All right. Good. So now I'm just going to take a listen and pay attention. I'm missing something up here that is going to help me out. And that is my output meters. All right, so can anybody offer any observations? Thank you, Rosaline, I see that there. Um, as to what this mix is missing? Well, the first thing is that it, it sounds very dry, like there's no it, space. It really needs a saxophone solo. Yeah, like a soprano sax, right, Arun? Definitely. You know playing a tritone away <laughs> okay so it's very dry I thought the piano was a little bit too loud up in the front so notice I didn't say the oboe was too soft I said the piano was too loud I want you to get in the habit of if something's if something's not audible what is too loud that's blocking it you know what I mean and the reason for that is if we look over here, we're at a, we're about halfway up, right? We're a little soft. We can make that up on the master bus. That's fine. But if we start, like, for example, if I start doing this, let me make this, these bigger. Now, look at the, right here, we got the DB, right? That's how, clip gain. That's called clip-based gain. If I start bringing that up, and notice the key command to bring that up. It's Control, Shift, and the upward arrow, right? So I'm going to bring that up really a lot, 10 dB. Our output meter is getting dangerously hot. So what I would say is that overall, this particular piece was recorded a little too soft. So what you want to do is you, and also how's the sound today? Everything, not, nothing's distorted. Everything's audible. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, what you want to do is you want to find that balance between the clips being at a good level but not so hot that you have no room to play, no over overhead or no headroom, and um, too soft, right? So I recorded this too soft, and that's an issue. So you'll have to see if there are issues in the sessions that you, the stems that you import. So I'm going to bring this down a few. So I'm just going to give this 5 dB of gain and then that's better. But the piano is still a little loud. So I'm just going to take the clip gain here and back it down. Okay, so that's a good starting point for a good basic balance, right? I got my gain staging right, and I took care of the one issue I heard was that the piano was way too loud. There are other issues that we'll get into as we're completing this mix, but that's the first thing. So 
back to more organization. We have three food groups of instruments. We've got winds, pitch percussion, and strings. And we're going to make three groups. So to make a group, I'm going to click on the top most track. I'm going to hold the shift key down. And I'm going to click on the bottom most track of that group so that my winds are all selected here. Command G opens up the group window or the group create a group menu. I'm going to call this winds. Now let's take a look at this. Make sure that follow globals is checked. I will learn about this as we go along. But right here, these are the tracks that are currently in the group. If you made a mistake and you left something out, right? Let's say I, I wanted the piano in this group. I could highlight that and add it. If you have something in this group that you do not want, you would highlight it and you would remove it. It's very simple. So we've got wins. And I would do my groups from top to bottom so that they are coordinated with the order of your tracks. So make sure you get your tracks ordered first from top to bottom before you start making groups. Now I want my pitched percussion. So I'm going to highlight the piano track and then hold down the option key and highlight the Glock and then command G. Whoops, excuse me. Command G. And I'll call this pitched pitch perk. That's fine. I know what that is. Anybody looking at it would know what it is. Again, just double check. I want my piano, my harp, and my Glock. And then we've got our strings. Now, you notice that my, <clears throat> excuse me, my tracks list and my groups list is closed. You all should know that down here in the bottom right hand, left hand corner, I'm sorry, there is a, 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 a vertical line with a right facing arrow. Click on that and it opens it up. Now, you notice that you can take your groups, it's way down at the bottom. Just like with your MIDI editor, if you hover over the top border, you can click and drag this up so that it's a little easier to see. Right? You hover and it turns to a cross and you can resize all this stuff. You notice that these three are all highlighted. You do not want them highlighted while you're working. So simply hold the option key down and click and then this one is active. You do not want it active, so basically click on this little dot here. Oops, hold on a second. There we go. I'm sorry. Right, so these are all set now. So hold the option key down and click on the name strings here and then click on any of these tracks here and they become unselected. So we've got our groups set up, and now the next thing we need to do is add some tracks. So can anybody take a guess as to what kinds of tracks we are going to add for mixing? What do we need for mixing? Uh, VCA tracks and aux tracks. Correct. So what are the what? Can anybody explain? what we're going to use the VCA tracks for. I know that we've done some mixing, but we, we're really going to hone in on it. And it beso besides Sam. Um, to, to mix like each group individually, to have control of each group. Control of each group, right. So it depends on how big your session is, right, and what your end goal is. And I'm going to talk about the difference between a few different techniques, and you can choose the one that you want to um, I forgot to bring my coffee in here damn it I'm gonna have to take a break in a minute but we'll just carry on <laughs> um, VCA tracks is one kind of track we're gonna add 
and there's a reason that we add those, and then AUX tracks. The AUX tracks will do two functions. They will control the outputs of each group, which makes it easier to do sub-mixes, and AUX tracks will also be there for our time-based effects, like reverb and delay. So let's add our VCA masters first. All right, so I'm just going to click anywhere. And then it's Command Shift N. And we have three groups. So we're going to add three VCA masters. They're not stereo or mono. Don't worry about that. It's just a VCA master. And the number is three. And again, I'm going to hold down the Option key and click. And what I, oh, actually, what I should do before that is I like to color code all my VCAs with no color, right? And let me show you how to do that. So if you click on the color code palette, and you see right here on the upper right-hand side of the palette, it says none. I'm going to click this, and it'll become black and grayed out. All right, now hold down the Option key. I'm going to take the first one, drag it up just under the bassoon, the second one just under the Glock, and the third one I'm going to leave where it is. Now, to get the VCA masters to work, you have to assign them to groups. So the first one is wins, right? So you're just, just assigning right here where it says no group to your first group, which is wins. Your second one you're going to assign to pitched percussion, and your third one, you're going to assign it to strings. Okay, and now we're going to name them. So we'll call this WINS VCA. There's a lot of preparation. I like to do a lot of preparation work. It makes the end goal of mixing much better, right? And then I'll call this uh, And then this one is strings. Okay, so what's great about this is that now, if I was looking at this as a composer that reads music, if I was looking at this like it's in a score, right? In a score, between the different sections, you have a space, and it helps you to find and navigate a score. Like if you've got a big score with 50 or 60 instrument lines in it, those spaces between all the different groups helps you to know that the top one is the strings, I mean the winds, the next one is the brass. It, it is very helpful. We've only got a handful of tracks here, so it's not that difficult to really see where everything is. But sometimes if I'm mixing one of my film scores and I've got over 100 tracks of audio, Having these VCAs helps me to, to know what I'm looking at. Now, they're also good for mixing because we can play. I just want to hear the winds. I can solo that and just hear the winds. I just want to hear the pitched percussion. I just want to hear the strings. So we're going to see as we're mixing why being able to do that is really important. Now, there's some new features in some in the later versions of Pro Tools, um, which some of you have and some of you don't have. Master volume and reverb. Oh yeah, we do need a master track. Yes, Charlie, that's good, that's good. We'll, we'll add that after we add the AUX tracks. Thank you. So if you've got, let's see, which version of Pro Tools is this? 2020.9.1. I just down upgraded this a couple of weeks ago. So Pro Tools has finally done something that people have been asking for for years that you can do in Logic, Cubase, Performer, Ableton, 
and they've got something called track folders. And track folders are also really good for organization. And there's a bunch of, there's a couple of different kinds of track folders. And I haven't gone through all the two different kinds, so we're just going to use the one that I know, and I'll show you how to use it. So let's go right here. I'm going to highlight the click track. I'm going to go Command Shift N, and we're going to do three basic folders, right? And then I'm going to call this Wins Pitch Perk. Strings. And then what we can do is we can, uh, let me show you the key commands, what I'm doing here. I've highlighted this one. I'm holding the shift key down and this, and I'm going to click and just drag here. And notice in this wins, there's a, a yellow or a gold box around the name wins. So in other words, watch what happens to this box as I drag this up. See, it becomes gold. That means you're, it's active, and if I let go, all my wins go into there, and then let's color code that. So I'm just gonna hold the Shift key down and select all these guys, open up my color palette, and make sure they're all the same color. And then right here on the lower left hand, see, this actually takes over one of the functions of the um, VCA, in that you can solo a folder, but a VCA you can also do vo like volume, fine tune volume adjustments of uh, sections, which you can't really do with the tracks folder. So, if I hold down my Option key and unselect those, when I close the folder, you see all my wins are in there. And let's get our strings down here and our pitch percussion down here. And so let's get our pitched percussion. Click and drag that into here. It's gold. It's in there. Huh. So for some reason that time, it actually changed the color automatically. Well, that's pretty cool. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> and we'll do the same thing here. Oh, I think I know what I did. Nope. All right. Let's, let's change these all to the same color. Let's make these dark green. And now, like, our whole session is just a couple of folders, right? So just imagine if you, you don't have to use folders on your mix. Oh, let's get our, um, I made a mistake here. We, I want the VCA out of the folder. Right, I don't want the VCA in the folder. Okay. Right, so this only has like 12 tracks in this particular piece, but just imagine you've got, uh, again, 80, 90, 70, 60 tracks, 100 tracks, having them in about 10 folders reduces the amount of up and down, excuse me, up and down scrolling you have to do. So, our, our, and also the other thing too is that if you notice this, there are four lanes inside of the VCA, in, inside of this. It lets you know that there's four tracks in there. This has three lanes, it's got three tracks. This has three lanes, it's got three tracks. So there's a lot of benefits to using folders. This is a new feature in Pro Tools. I haven't been, this is the first time I've actually shown anybody in any of my classes this. And I'm only just now starting to incorporate it, but it is a big help. All right, so let's add our reverb tracks and delay. So I'm going to add two kinds of reverbs. Well, actually, yeah, let's do this. Yeah, our reverbs. So I want to add one, two reverbs, one delay, 
and I want to have an AUGS input for each group of instruments. So there's three groups of instruments. So I want six. stereo augs inputs and they're down at the bottom and what I want to do with these augs inputs is I want to solo safe them so I'm going to hold down the command key and click on the S for each one of these because I always want anything coming through them to sound and what I'm going to do is just for right now this will be Verb one, and I'll change these to be more specific. Verb two, the next one will be delay. Then this one will be winds. You can either call this winds master or winds sub or winds sub master, A anything that you want. I'll just call this winds sub. I'll just call this winds master. And then pitched perk strings master and we need to set inputs for all of these because you notice right here there's no input so before I do that let me um, reset my inputs Have I showed have I showed you guys how to reset what your inputs look like? So sometimes if you get a session from me, it changes your inputs. Uh, not that I recall. Okay. So this is a good tip. So go to setup, go to I slash O. And then if you go to bus and you hit default, it will switch everything back to the base configuration and you can do that with the output and the input and then you hit OK because if I send you a session or somebody sends you a session their input and output settings take over your Pro Tools session there's no way to override that so to get it back to the base start you would go through the I.O. and just do default. So I'm going to select the verb one, hold down the shift key. Uh, let's do this. Hold down the shift key. Click on this one here. And then I think it's these three. Let me just double check this. Right. So if you hold... Command, Option, and Shift. It will set all of these inputs up in contiguous order. So this one is bus 1 and 2. This one is bus 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, 9 and 10, 11 and 12. If you want them to all have the same, and the same thing you could do with the outputs. If you want them to all have the same input, it's Option, Shift, and then you click on the input you want, and you notice they're all back to bus one and two. But if it's command, option, shift, click on one, and then they will load right back in properly. And then the next last thing we need to do, uh, we've got two more things to do. We gotta rename all these inputs. We gotta set these outputs of all the tracks to the appropriate inputs. So let's add some reverb. So we're going to add So those of you that have you guys might have space. If not, you use D, D verb. So I'm going to use space. Um And I'm going to put, I'll, I'll just, this is a church. Uh, let's see, they have halls. I'm going to add a hall. So let's do, 
we'll just do an auditorium. So this is nine feet. Now I'll talk about this in a second. So that's that. And then I'm going to option, click, and drag. So I've got space on this one too. And then I'll go to halls. I'll go back to auditorium. And then I'll have... Uh, A different perspective. I'll talk about this in a second. So, hall, close, and the next is hall. Now, I'm picking hall because it's orchestral music, right? There are different kind uses for different kinds of reverbs, and we'll be going through that. And for delay, we're just going to use our um, mod delay three, and we'll just leave it like that. So, we need to name our inputs. And to do that for the new guys, you right-click on the name, and this little menu comes up, and you rename it. And it should be the same name as the title of the track. So I'm going to go Hall, Close. This one is Hall Far. This one is Delay. When do we get to the actual mixing? Come on. <laughs> And this is winds. And also then, we can also do Command-Shift-N, one stereo master fader. All right, now, to assign outputs, we'll open up our folder, right? And I'm going to make these tracks bigger. So to make the tracks bigger and smaller this way, it's option, control, and the up arrow to make them bigger and the down arrow to make them smaller. Now notice, we want to take the outputs and set all of the outputs of these four tracks to the same input. So I click on the top one, hold the Shift key down, click on the bottom one. I'm going to go Option, Shift. I'm going to go to the output, which is the bottom slot here. And I'm going to set this to, these are my wins, to my wins stereo. And notice the outputs of all those went to wins. The same thing with my pitched percussion. Make that bigger. All right, option shift. Pitched percussion. And notice that the zooming doesn't really affect the size of these tracks. They stay what they were when you put them in the folder. So select the top one, hold the Shift key down. Option, Shift, Strings. Okay, great. Now we're ready to mix. Okay, so this took me about 25 minutes to set up. 20 minutes to set up, right? So you're gonna, you guys are going to be going on and you're going to be mixing. What I would suggest you do is you set up a, uh, like a, a, a timeline or an outline or a game plan. And your game plan will be... We, so this, this assignment is going to be due... Let's take a look at this in our classroom. So this is due October 26th, all right? So it's due in three weeks. It's 
do then. Oh, right. Also remember, next week, class is on Wednesday. Next week, class is on Wednesday. Wednesday, class is next week is on Wednesday. Monday is a Wednesday at Queens College. Wednesday is a Monday at Queens College. So I've got the in instructions here. So what you want to do is you've got three weeks. So the first week, you want to set up your session. It'll probably take you guys a couple of hours, right? Well, you want to figure out which track you want to mix, and you want to set up your session like this. It'll probably take you a couple of hours over the course of the week because you're, you're not going to remember everything, and you're going to have to probably watch the, the video of the class to remember and then the next week, you'll do the next bit that we're about to do. And then the following week, you'll continue on with your mix. So if you set goals for each week, and instead of waiting for the last week to try to do everything, you'll be able to go back and fine tune your mix and make it sound better. So we're gonna, I'm just going to be spending the next three, three weeks showing you different kinds of mixes and different techniques and hopefully you can incorporate these into your mix as you're going along. Uh, Professor, I was wondering if you could show us one thing. Um, my, from like the last uh, mixing project we had in last semester, the, it might just be the aux tracks, but the, the names I set up for like the outputs or, or the buses are still the same and I can't figure out how to like revert them back right to so that's that's what i was talking normal. about with when you go to your io and you go to bus so you see that these all got changed here before when i did this these were not can you show us, can you show us your yeah. screen oh i'm sorry thank you don't worry okay let me do that all again <laughs> i'm tv producer college professor oh it's too much okay um so, set up, I, O. Now, I went and set these up before, and they continued on with the different bus names, right? You notice here that the first written bus is bus 13 and 14. That's because this was bus 1 and 2, uh, this was bus 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, right? It just, it just made, we renamed them. Every session I open up going forward will have this configuration. So to get it to set back to zero or to, to default, you hit default. Now, because I'm in an open session, these will stay in there. But let's do this. Let me save this. Let me close the session. Now, if I go to I.O. here, right, and I go to default, notice it gets it right back to zero. So before you open up a session, if you want to refresh and get back to default, just hit bus one, you know, hit bus, and you can do the same thing with your outputs, just default and default, and then you have to hit OK. And then everything gets set back to the default settings. Is that clear, Sam? Yeah, that's clear. Thank you. All right. Now we can just go to open recent, light orchestra mix. mix. You, can, you can go one of two ways here, right? You could start balancing things out. And what I would say about mixing is that volume is one of the most important aspects of mixing. Balancing the volumes of the instruments relative to each other is really important. But also, as I mentioned, I believe, last week in class, EQ is frequency-based volume control. Compression is automated volume control. So a lot of mixing is about volume control. It, you can't do that without the, some of the other elements of the mix in there. 
So one of the things, it's, it's interesting for me to listen to this piece because I wrote this, I think, maybe seven or eight years ago, and I can hear the age of the sample, the, the samples, because um, I've, you know, the, the sample libraries have grown so much over the past seven years, especially orchestral samples. But this is very dry. So I want to just solo the winds. So I can do that one of two ways. I can either solo that in the folder here. Now, some of you that have an older version of Pro Tools, you won't have folders. All right. So you don't have to have folders to do a mix. I'm just showing them to you in case you have a newer version of Pro Tools and you want to start using them. You do not have to use track folders. Not necessary at all. But if I want to solo the winds, I've got my VCA here. I'm just going to hit the S button to solo it. And there's two things. We want to set up, we want to get, there's th three things. We've got our volume issues. We also have our space issue. Where, where they sit in the sound stage in terms of front to back, how much reverb is on it. But also we want to listen to our panning. Remember last week I talked about the four dimensions of mixing. There's, you know, pitch low to high. There's spacing left to right. There's volume soft to loud. And then there's distance front to back, right? Whether something seems like it's right in your face or a little bit further away. And the distance thing is kind of an illusion, because things really aren't further away. It's just we do things to make it seem that way. Unless you've recorded it that way, then you do have a sense of depth. But it's not like hearing something live. In other words, if you're in an auditorium and you're listening to something further away and something closer to you, you, you can hear you. It's easy because you're hearing things in a perspective all around you up above you below you but you don't we don't have that here in a in this kind of a mix this is only left speaker and right speaker stereo so i want to listen to my sound stage and make sure that i've got things balanced left to right now with these orchestral samples they recorded them in what's called in situ s i t u and that means as you're if you're the conductor where they would be seated normally, right? So if you think about an orchestra, the high strings are on your left, the cellos are at your right, and then the other instruments are sprinkled all around. And there are different places that different conductors put them, but there's, you can look it up, right? You could take a seating chart and you can look. So let's take this one that's got all these pretty colors. Right, you can see the violin is here, cellos and basses, second violins, violas. Then you're back a little bit, and this is helpful, right? So look, our, our clarinet, flute in the middle, oboe, then our bass, like, well, uh, piccolo, flute, oboe, and then clarinet, bassoon, this would be bass clarinets also, and then look, our percussion and piano and all these things are further away. So you can look at this and even though these are all, and then you can just right click and you can save this image as uh, orc. And then you can refer to it. And there's different ones. Right, this one's more detailed. Baroque orchestra doesn't have as many instruments, right? And it's interesting. So this is from the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. They play in a place called Meyerson Hall in Dallas, and I've played there for two weeks of my life. Uh, uh, I was doing a touring show that was a concert, set up in a concert venue, and we played. I was on this very stage here. It's a be beautiful, incredibly beautiful hall. Um, okay. Right? So they've got all these different seating charts. So that's helpful because while these were recorded as they might sit, they also sound very dry. So that will help you with your reverb choices. So let's tell you can't hear this because it's not stereo, but if you listen back on YouTube. So for right now, I'm hearing this right in the center, right? Pretty much. And if you look here, at the output, it's panned just a little bit to the right. It is a little bit louder in my right ear, 
But if we go to the flute, that's panned a little bit to the left. And the clarinet, you could see, is very center. And the bassoon is in the right. So these are, this is pretty balanced. So you don't have to worry about panning with this one, right? We'll work on panning more next week. I'll, I'll have something else that we'll be mixing. I'll, I'll mix for you. All right. But what I want to do is I want to add some depth to this. So there's two ways you can think of this. You can add depth, right, directly on each track. Or you can go down to your... Oh, these, these need to be... I'm sorry, these all need to be color-coded. Sad. Sad, sad, sad. I would have failed myself. Okay, that's better. And save. Or we could take care of it on a global level by sending from the master track that the winds are coming out of. So in other words, all these audio outputs here if I were to solo the winds, they're all coming through this audio track. See how if I mute that, they're gone? So I could take a bus, and let's say we do the hall far, and I could send some. So that means everything, all the winds are going through that bus. And... I do that often. Not always, but often. That's a that's a that's an acceptable way to go for an orchestral piece. Right? So I'm gonna do that right now and I'm gonna listen to my reverb. So what I'm doing is I'm playing it a little bit and then I'm hitting the space bar. And I'm listening to the tail of the reverb, right? And I'm not liking what I'm hearing. And I'll tell you what I don't like about it. It's, this, this, it's got a funny, it's, it's a little dark, and it's got a funny ring to it. So I don't like that. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to change that. And let's go here, and let's try something else. Let's try the concert bag or whatever this is. So let's try the front. Let's take a listen. That's much better. It's less dark. All right, so... Now, there are all these controls here that gets really, really, really um, detailed. But what I want to do is I want to turn down some of the low end. So this is the low gain here. That sounds much better to me. All right? Now I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to go to that Concert de Bigao, and I'm going to do the back so that we're in the same space. Now, let me just talk a little bit about the kinds of two kinds of reverb. So there's, we've been using D-verb, that's something that's called an algorithmic reverb. And I, I think I've explained this before, but it's always worth talking about if, again and reinforcing. So it basically does math, to, to, and it takes a lot of echoes and makes them really close together, and they've got all these other parameters that they use algorithms for to simulate a physical space. So that's one thing. This here, space, is something that's called convolution reverb. And convolution is a very interesting 
technique. It basically takes a sample of a space, right? So in other words, <clears throat> we created samples. We, we did some samples. By, well, I did them for you, but I recorded some stuff and we made instruments to play using, they call that samples. Well, it's the same thing here. And I've exp I, I, I did explain this last week, I believe. But let's say we're in Lefrac Hall and we had a speaker at the conduct at the conductor's po where the conductor sits stands, and we played a sine wave suite, something that went like that, and we had a pair of microphones about twenty feet from there, and we recorded that. That is called an impulse response. It takes a snapshot of the sound of that room at that moment. And when you use an impulse response in this kind of, of um, reverb, it takes that impulse response and using convolution, which I can't really explain, it makes an incredibly accurate picture in time, frozen in time, of that room with that kind of signal being played through it. So what they've done here with this, this place here, this is the room, is they have microphones at the front and they have microphones at the back. So you get two different perspectives. So you could simulate something that's closer and further away in the same physical space. There's this whole thing now that they use to record electric guitars that uses impulse responses to capture the characteristics of a speaker cabinet. And this way you, you can just plug your guitar amp through an attenuator. If it's a tube amp, you don't want to blow the transformer, so you put it through something that is a, 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 um, a not an attenuator, a, a load box. And that load box safely allows you to turn on your um, power amp and then you take the output of the load box and you run it into something with these impulses and you can record that directly into your computer and you get the same very similar characteristics as to miking a guitar cabinet um, I have something like that you can't see it it's down there for my guitar amps um, and it works really well so convolution is a really interesting t technique so some of you might have space in your uh, Pro Tools, and some of you might not, in which case you would use D-Verb. And, well, I'll use D-Verb next week, but I just wanted to show you a little bit different. Professor, I had a quick question about using the aux uh, inputs yep. or the aux tracks. Do you, um, I don't know if I could uh, word this problem correctly, but when I, um, I set up like a reverb aux track and I sent the bus to a recording or like a, a clip, like one of the tracks um if i singled out the track it wouldn't you like it wouldn't pick up the reverb bus unless i singled out the reverb as well do you need to have the right. instrument so so VCA? no so do you notice that i've got these solo saved did you have those did you do that no i just i just had a uh, highlighted yellow okay let me show you this so oh you did this that's yeah, that's how you got it to work if you did this to both of them uh, yeah, I had to I had to click the reverb right. too in so, order to hear so it. So notice here now, this is dark. I don't know if you could see that. The S yeah, is yeah, dark. Yeah, it's like the regular. Un right. Un so if I hold down the command key and click on that, it gets grayed out. Okay. That means that anytime I solo any instrument that will have something go sent to the hall close. It will play. Oh. It will play. That's what Solo Safe does. Uh, okay, so I don't need to then highlight that one. Correct. Yellow, which right. So like it's, when, it's, I so, it's, when I highlight when I solo yellow, and then like a like a clip. Right. Correct. So work. all okay. of your all of your augs tracks. Yeah. Some people either. Some people either leave the augs track. Uh, like well, if it's if it's for an output like this, 
you know what? I don't want to confuse everybody. This is the way we're going to do it in our class. There's, there's other ways and other people have other methods they use and they work really well, but let's, let's just all stick to the same thing. Um, okay. So I've got reverb on my winds. Now let me go back down here to my pitched percussion. And I've got harp. Okay, so this is panned also well already. So let me just make these a little bit bigger. This is very soft here. We may have to turn the do something with volume here, but you can see that the harp is panned to the left and the celeste is panned a little bit to the right and the piano is in the center. And I think I'm going to leave it that way. Now, let's, let's talk about individual reverbs for individual instruments. So let's try this. I'm going to take my bus and I'm going to go to my hall far and try that on the piano and see what that sounds like. So I'm just going to solo the piano. All right. Now, that has a similar problem as hall close, as it's a little too muddy for me. There's a, I want to show you a different solution. So I'm going to go right here. I'm going to click here, and I'm going to put in our friend EQ1, and I'm going to do a high pass. And that's cleaner. So, again, there's multiple ways, right, to achieve the same thing. In this space, I turn down some of the low gain here. And in this one, I wanted to show you a different technique, so I just added a high-pass filter, which is something that we've done in the past. Now, I've got the hall far on the piano, but I want to try a different reverb on the harp. So I'm going to go to hall close. And then I'm going to click and drag that down. I'm going to option, click, and drag that down. And it's right here. So I've put, right, I've got two different reverbs. I've got hall far for the piano, and I've got close hall for the harp and the celeste. And I'm going to bring up right now the volume on the celeste a little bit. All right, so I'm using this clip-based gain. And now I want to mute the strings and just listen to everything I've got so far. So I went down here to my VCA and I've muted my strings. Okay, so listen to that again and listen to the difference. Listen to the... So what, what's the piano doing there? Is it the melody or the accompaniment? Accompaniment. Right. So let me know if you think it's the right volume, too soft or too loud. So the piano is also playing the melody as well as the harmony and I'm feeling like it's sometimes the, the melody part of the piano is taking over the, the oboe, All right? It's too loud. So let's take a look at this, and let's go through it. We're going to 
go to slip mode. Now let me show you another keyboard shortcut. If you hold down command, oh wait, actually, right. If you've got function keys on your computer keyboard, F1 is shuffle, F2 is slip, spot, and grid. So we're going to go to F2. Okay. So that I can get in between and just listen. Okay, so do you hear, see how in the, let me make this waveform bigger. Right here, you can see it, that this area here is louder, right? You can see the waveform has more width. The waveform has more width, you know, it's, it's wider over here than it is here. So I'm going to want to treat this area a little differently than this area here. And there's a couple of, let me show you a couple of ways to do it. So I can put my cursor here, my using the tr selector tool, click and drag right to there. Right, so this is the first phrase. And I'm gonna use Command E and I've separated that out, and I'm going to use clip gain to make that softer, and I'm going to listen. So I brought that down to mi minus 2.8 dB. Now, let's try something different. So I'm going to separate out this area here. And I'm going to highlight, right? So what I did was I put my... It already starts off with um, a separate separation. I'm going to put my playback head right here, right before the next bit. And again, using Command-E, I'm going to separate that out. And I'm going to bring this down to minus 2.8. But this area here is still a little too loud for me. So right now we're in waveform view. We're going to switch so that we're looking at the volume here. So click and go to volume here. And you notice there's this horizontal line here. I'm going to use, there's two ways that you can affect this, right? I can use the trim tool, click and drag down, and you see how it changed the volume on the section that was separated out. In other words, this is a separate clip now. If I go to volume and I use the trimmer tool, it will just affect, and I hover in this area, it will just affect that section. That's one technique. But what I want to do is I just want to affect this note here. Right? So let me zoom in on that. Just these two notes here. So I'm going to click he here, right at the beginning of this note, and right at the beginning of this last note. And then I'm going to, so where I notice I clicked and there are two dots there. There's a dot right here and a dot all the way over here. And then I'm going to click here. And let's see, maybe over here. And I'm going to drag this down a little bit. All right. So now what will happen is if you watch our volume meter here, as I play this, so it, it automatically, it automates the volume there. So I've made this whole clip softer, but then I've also done a little bit of work to clean up these notes I played too loudly.
and now this whole bit is too loud. So let me show you a different technique. So I've already got a separation right here. You can see that this is a clip. I want to go to the very end, Command E, and I'm going to bring this whole thing down. And I'm going to eyeball this so that the waveforms look about the same. Now what happens with the piano here is that it changes texture because So can anybody tell me what I did there on the piano? So listen to this. What's different about this and the next section? Ups down the octave. Thank you, Arun. So this is an octave lower than this. And that's just an arranging technique that I use all the time. And additionally, We're listening to, let me get these all similar heights again. We've got the oboe. We change texture. Right, so the flute is... So... A flute is played by blowing, this type of a flute, is played by blowing air across a hole. And then you use your fingers to change the length of the tubing by lifting pads up and down that are across, uh, I forget what that thing's, what, the, what that's called. Arun, what is that called? The length of the flute? The body of the flute? Oh, shoot. There's a name. The... Well, on your saxophone, what I'm would it be called? The bore, the, the the width of it. Yeah, well, across the length of the flute, right? So, an oboe is played this way, and you have the same thing. You change the length of the tube by opening and closing these pads that have holes on them, and the length of the tube will change the pitch. Now, there's one other difference between an oboe and a flute. The oboe is, the flute is played by blowing air across a hole. It's true that with an oboe, you're blowing air into a hole, but it's being affected by what's called a double reed. Now, a saxophone, a rune, a saxophone has a single reed, right? So can you explain what that is? Yeah, so it's, it's a piece of cane that, uh, that goes flat against the table of the mouthpiece. So do you see his, his, his picture there? Arun, talk again, and see what his mouth is in? That black thing that his mouth is wrapped around? That's the mouthpiece of his soprano saxophone. And there's a little cl metal clamp, and at the bottom of that clamp is a cane reed. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, right, and, and so what happens is that reed is flat against the mouthpiece, and then as I blow air, the tip of the reed vibrates up and down. Um, so it vibrates perpendicular to the length of the saxophone. And that vibration is what moves the air to create the sound. And on a saxophone, that's, that's just considered a reed or a single reed instrument. You notice that he's got the reed and then there's a black mouthpiece on top of that and then there's a clamp that goes around the mouthpiece. With an oboe and a bassoon, an English horn and a contrabassoon and a contrabass bassoon, these are called double reed instruments. And this is just like a little inst instrument information for your own thing. What Arun does is he buys boxes of reeds that are pre-made, and then he picks the best ones, and then he might do a little bit of work with a carving knife, correct? Yeah, see, he's got his picture of it up there. You see that? Yeah, that's right. I, I use a thing called a reed geek. But yeah, so so... This is the ligature, and this is the single reed. So it goes against the mouthpiece like this. And then when I blow air, this tip of it vibrates up and down. And that's what creates the sound. And if you get a reed, you 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 customize it with a little with a knife. Correct? Yeah, because yeah, so there might be asymmetrical or something like that. So then you'd have to adjust it so that it vibrates symmetrically and things like that. 
And it's like a, for, for read players, getting a good read is like a lifetime journey. You know, and you tr you treat it with like uh, like it's a like it's a, a baby. You know, like with like the most utmost care. If you if you get a good read, it can really make your day, right? And then it's totally devastating when your good read dies, or you do something to it and you damage it. Right, and they don't last forever. And weather weather affects them, and the quality of the cane is not consistent. And you know, the global cl climate change even affects growing of cane trees. Right, so it's it's a it's a whole issue. So. But he basically buys a box that has like 20 reeds in it. And they're all different thickness, like you have guitar strings or, you know, 0 0.09, 0 0.1010, right? Ten, nines, tens, like they're different thicknesses. The same thing with reeds have different thicknesses. And they have, some people like a really thick reed and some people like um, a thinner reed. And if somebody's a doubler, meaning they play baritone saxophone, alto saxophone, tenor saxophone, and clarinet, uh, they they have they might have different thicknesses that help them to navigate the amount of air difference that you would need between a clarinet, let's say, and a a bass a, ba a baritone saxophone. So, an oboe is a double reed instrument, and even though you can buy oboe reeds, a vast majority of oboe players get cane and they carve and cut up and make their own reeds and they have something called a bocal that they tie the re they tie the reeds together so there's a reed on the top and on the bottom and your mouth completely covers both reeds so these all have um oh, reeds have an effect on the sound so a saxophone can be a very buzzy sound which can anybody like if, if somebody like Ben Webster is playing it they can really make the saxophone raspy and when they do that can anybody take a guess as to uh, what they're changing in terms of the sound on a technical level they're adding something to the sound don't they like um, make a like vibrate their own vocal cords. They can. Make it like they can do that. Yep, yep. They can do that. But they, the way they play, they can also ch like by how much pressure they're putting on the reed, they can change the sa the, the sound and what's hap the timbre of the sound. And what's happening is that the buzzier the sound gets, the more overtones you're adding to the sound, which means that there's more audio information coming out of the sound. An oboe has twice the amount of reed. You know, it's got two reeds. Even though the reeds are tinier, it's got two reeds that vibrate against each other. So it's got, an oboe is very filled with, with overtones. So let's take a look at that. Right, so every the, we have these in the school computers. There's this company, Blue Cat Audio. You can download their frequency analyst for free, and it's a good thing to have in your kit. So I've got it going across the master bus now. And let's take a listen, let's take a look. We're going to solo the oboe and the flute. And let's look at the frequency chart for the oboe. You see up here all of these overtones, right? You see how how unsmooth that is up here? That's that's what the reeds do. So this is your fundamental area here, and then these are all your overtones. Let's compare that with Mr. Flute. See how much quieter these are and how further spaced apart the overtones are? Uh, let's see, where's the reset here? Hey, come on, man. Ah, here we go. Okay. Right, so here's the flute playing the same melody. It does have these peaks over here, but they're not as close together. Right? Not as many of them. Look at that. That's crazy looking. So those are all individual pitches, every one of those, and they're sounding together at the same time. So the up upshot of that is that 
an oboe, like something with all those overtones, even if they're at the same relative volume, will sound louder because there's more audio information coming at you. So how does that help us to understand that? Now, the clarinet, let's look at the clarinet, right, which is the next, uh, oh, the clarinet and the flute are playing together. So let's get rid of the flute and let's do the clarinet. has a, a hollower sound, so... Right, so it's got a very strong fundamental over here. And overtones, yes, but not as many. And then let's listen to the bassoon. So the bassoon has got fundamental and it's got overtones here, but it's playing very soft, so you're not hearing a lot of the raspiness, but a bassoon can have, ah, there you go, you see all those overtones? It's very similar to the oboe, but an octave lower, right? It's like the relationship of an electric guitar to a bass guitar in the orchestra. So, it's a little technical level. So, what I want to do here is I want to listen to the, to the winds and, again, and the piano in the second verse. So I've, I just muted the piano for a second, and I've got a flute and a clarinet. Two things. I want to balance them out so that they, they sound like a flute clarinet, a flunet, right? Not two separate instruments, but one instrument that's blended together. So for me right now, the clarinet's a little loud. So I'm going to bring, I separated that out. I highlighted the area here. Let me do that again. And I'm going to separate that out, Command E. And I'm going to bring the volume down. And I'm going to listen. Right, so I just brought it down half a dB or one dB, right? And make, or one and a half dB. No clarinet. Clarinet. And you could see that the clarinet now sounds like, the clarinet and the flute sound like one instrument where the clarinet is the fundamental and the flute is the overtone of the clarinet, right? Where it's one, one unit, not two or three units. So that's, that's what I want to do there. But I want to do one more thing too. The flutes... The flute, I, I want it to be a little bit breathier, a little bit less round, so it cuts through more. As a solo piece right now, that sounds fine, but I want to give it a little bit more, I want to get rid of some of that mid-range, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add our EQ7. Now, I went over this last week a little bit, correct? Yay, nay? I believe I went over this last week, but... Let me show you this again. So this is our EQ7. And oh, what happened to my... Oh, I got the wrong thing here. Sorry. <laughs> I pushed the wrong button. Okay. So this is our EQ7. And it's got an input and an output. And we're going to get into that in a minute. It has a high-pass filter over here a low pass filter here and you activate them by pushing the turning this in blue right and they do the same thing as EQ1 same thing then it's got color coded you got the red you got a red dot orange orange dot yellow yellow dot green green dot and purplish blue purplish blue so this is your low frequency low mid frequency Mid frequency, high mid frequency, and high frequency. You got your Q, which is the width of the EQ curve. 
You've got the frequency, which is the center of the frequency that you're going to be affecting, and you've got your gain. Now, remember, EQ is frequency-dependent volume control. That's how I look at it, right? So I'm going to try and turn down some of the overtones in the flute to make it sound less muddy and a little bit more light. And let me show you how I'm going to do that. So I'm going to play it. So I happen to know that it's somewhere in this area that I'm going to play around with. So I'm going to go to the yellow and I'm going to turn up my cue so that it's very high. And watch what happens. So if I turn up the cue so it's very high, you see how that's very spiky? If I turn it down, it becomes very wide. So I've made it very spiky because I want to sweep for the frequency. And I'm going to turn down the gain because I want to see where it is that it's less muddy. And I'm going to play and I'm just going to... So it's right somewhere in there, I'm hearing it. See, I'm exaggerating that. And then just, right, just you fix it so that it's not so dramatic unless you're doing something surgical where you need to get rid of a buzz or something like that. But I'm just taking a little bit out over here. And then what I want to do is I want to add some high frequency, right? I'm exaggerating this. Right. So you can hear the breath more now. So I'm going to back that down a little bit. And then with the flute, I don't need anything that's playing down here. So let's take a look. And you can keep both of these open if you turn the target mode off. That's this red button here. And then I can open up my flute EQ and turn the button off there. I'm going to bypass. So see, there's a couple of things down here. We don't need that. That just gets in the way. So I'm going to turn the high pass filter on and I'm going to just sweep up just a little bit like that. So there was stuff down in the 40 and 100 range. So that's no longer there. And it sounds breathier, so I can bring this back this down. Bypassed. In. So it's very subtle, but it's cleaner for me right now. All right? And that just is going to take you time to learn how to listen to that. And now let's listen to that with the clarinet. Now, one really important thing about EQ, you see right here, you've got your input volume and your output volume. They should be the same. So if you're going to be adding a lot of frequencies, you need to back your output down so that input and output match. So right now, the input's a little bit louder because I've taken away. So I could turn up my output just a little bit just to balance those out. Just one dB. It's called volume matching. So that sounds better for me. And let's listen to that now with the piano. All right, now the piano. Muddy. I know this piano really well. It's the Ivory German Grand, and so I know what I need to do to this because I do it all the time. So I'm but I'll I'll do it for you 
here. So I know that in this area here around 500, it's a little muddy. So let's get this down into this area here. Let me exaggerate, all right? Right, you can hear how bad that sounds, right? Because it gets away the meat. But if I exaggerate that, you hear how that sounds really, that doesn't sound pleasant. That's the problem frequency with this piano. So just do a little dip, just two dB and I've got a very wide cue. Minus two dB. And it's a very subtle difference, but that's the thing about mixing is that if things are recorded well, which these are for the most part, these instruments, you want to just do subtle changes because they all add up over the course of the mix. You know what I mean? You don't want to be too dramatic, too dr drastic at first and so you understand what you're doing. But now... Okay, now we're going to do one more thing with volume here, and then we'll call it a day, and we'll pick up with this next week. When a wind player plays, when a string player plays, when a brass player plays, it's not da, 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 it's da, da. There's a slight... On something like this, there's a slight attack. You can change the attack, but on long notes, because these are samples, you want to give the impression that they're getting ready to take another breath and they bring the volume down, right? Live players are of wind, brass, and string instruments are continually animating their sound, brings it to life. You think about a violinist, they got their bow going across and how fast or slow the bow moves or how much pressure they put on the bow, what kind of vibrato they're doing with their left hand, changes the sound. The same thing with the wind player. They can play a pitch and over the course of time they can change the timbre of that pitch with their embouchure and their playing technique. Just one pitch. So we want to simulate that in our mix. So let's do that with the oboe. And for that we're going to need to do volume automation. So it's an alliterative device that I use to remember. Automate to animate, right? So you're going to automate the volume to animate the sound a little bit. And there are other ways to animate a sound, which I'll show you as we go on with this. So let me solo the oboe. Whoops, let's do this. Let's unsolo the piano. Bee ba ba. So I could do this. I want to make a little bit of a, what's called a decrescendo here. It does it, but I want to do it more. So what I want to do is I want to put a dot on the beginning of the last note and a dot at the beginning of the second note in the next phrase. And then in the middle here, I'm going to click and drag down. Now, there are many ways to do this. Some guys use a controller and they mix like they're mixing on a mixing console. And that's, I do that too, but I'm just showing you a basic technique now. I'm going to exaggerate so you'll hear the difference. Right, so that's too much. So I'm going to back that up a little bit. And the same thing here. That's the long note. I'm not going to do the entire long note. I'm going to, it, it goes on for quite some time. So maybe somewhere around here. And then here's my first note of my next phrase and my second note. And then I'm going to click and drag down. So I make these little triangles. This is just a beginner way to do volume automation. There's other, I mean, there are times when I've got like all these different dots. And I'm just doing these tiny little things like this to make something sound right. But I'm giving you guys like, this is how you get started doing this. 
See how much more life that sound that, that is? Let's take a listen to those first two phrases. And I can also have a little bit more of a... Right, and a little fade out on the last note. Now look, this guy here is significantly louder than these other phrases here, so I'm going to fix that a little bit. Let's bring that down a little bit. Right, that's so much. I, it took me five minutes or three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, but it made it fifty times better. Right, because you can, it feels more like it's breathing. All right, and that's how you add life to these static samples into your mix. So what I would do is I would go through all the woodwinds in this first section up to where we are, and I would, I would do that. Right, and then we will do that next week. I'll pick up from here. Okay, so let's do something else. I want ba -di da right? It gets softer here. I want that louder. So I'm going to do the same thing. ba -di da right? So it's from a little beforehand. And we're going to go down here, and we're just going to just pick that up a little bit. Right? I'm just bringing out the qualities of what's there. You know, the music's there. And I'm just enhancing it with the mix. I'm br it's like, eh, it needs a little bit more pepper. <laughs> right? So just add a little pinch of pepper in your cooking. It needs a little bit garlic. It needs a little curry. When you're cooking, adding the spices. So that's detailed volume work. And, and, the better you get at that, the easier it will be for your mixes to live, right? A lot of it is volume, just adjusting volumes. So any questions on that? So what I would, well, before we get into any questions. So I don't want you guys to mix this track for the, for the project. So there are four other pieces there in that Dropbox. So it's class six. Stems for mixing. So you got acoustic tune, jazz tune, minor tune, and sports theme. We might have done the jazz tune. Uh, let me just see. So the acoustic tune. <laughs> That's one tune, and then there's a jazz tune. Did we mix this over the summer? Or last semester, this one? Okay, so if you did this over the summer, do not use this one. But if you didn't use this one, you, you can use it. And then a uh, minor tune. This one has a lot of problems that need to be rectified.
pick your tune. I don't have to see this, but over the next week, pick your tune, get it loaded in, get it organized, get it color coded. Don't need to do track folders. Uh, if it gets to be comp, you can always add track folders later. So maybe don't do track folders to start with. Color coded, organized by instrument group, create your groups, add your AUGS tracks and your um, VCA masters, get that all set up. Spend the next week and get that right so that it all works. And then you can start moving to your next, do the next bit where you're panning things and setting up volumes. So, and I think that that would be a good uh, amount of work. All right, so any question on any of this? Catchy as hell. Yes, it's very catchy. Yes, uh, uh, it's now the NBC, Comcast NBC sportscast. Uh, it's on in uh, the Bay Area. It's on in Sacramento. It's As a matter of fact, it's funny. I was just talking to my cousin who lives in right outside of San Francisco and he had the television on in the background and we're talking and like that tune came on. And I was like, you know, you, that's me on the tune right there. So anyway, um, it's on in uh, Los Angeles. It's on in Chicago, Detroit, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., uh, Rocky Mountain. It's on in the Houston area. Um and I forget the other areas. They they were, you know, in 2007, that's all the areas that the Comcast Sportsnet was on. And so it was on every day of the week because it was the sports recap show, and then they'd repeat it over and over again five or six times a day. So literally thousands of performances every quarter. So it's really good. Bought our house, let's put it that way. Okay. So without any further ado, take care of yourselves, and um, unless there's any questions on what we're, what we're doing going forward. All right. So we're going to upload uh, this assignment till October? It's not due until the end of the month, October 26th. I see. But get started now. Don't wait until October 24th to uh. start mixing, because if you've got questions, I want you to ask me in class so that I can answer them. All right, so get started. All right, everybody have a nice week, and I will talk to you next we a week from Wednesday. Next class is a week from Wednesday. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye -bye. everybody.